tonight on Nova. One year after the Exxon Valdez unleashed the biggest oil spill ever in the U.S., what have we learned? It's so easy to put oil in a tanker. What man hasn't discovered how to do is once oil is spilled from a tanker into the water, how to get that oil back into a tank. Will this disaster leave us better prepared for the future? Or are we headed for another big spill? Funding for NOVA is provided by Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management and technology services for defense, space and industry. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. Just after midnight on March 24, 1989, a distress call went out from the super tanker Exxon Valdez. Yeah, uh, should be on the radar there. We fetched up uh, hard ground north of uh, Goose Island, off Boy Reef. And evidently, uh, we get some oil, and uh, we're going to be here for a while. So began the nation's worst oil tanker spill ever. By first light, the Exxon Valdez sat crippled on Bly Reef, bleeding its cargo of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. This was to become America's most expensive industrial accident and one of its most notorious environmental disasters. There is no good place for an oil spill, but it would be hard to imagine any place worse than Prince William Sound. Before 1989, the region was famous mainly for its beauty and rich animal life. Prince William Sound was a national treasure in the state seen by many as America's last unspoiled wilderness. In the 1960s, the oil industry began drilling on the north slope of Alaska. An industry consortium, now Alieska, proposed an 800-mile pipeline to a point where the oil could be transferred to tankers and shipped to the lower 48. The choice for the terminus was the port of Valdez, at the top of Prince William Sound. Environmentalists were alarmed by the prospect of heavy tanker traffic in and out of the pristine port, and the possibility of a catastrophic spill. But an Alaska contingency plan stated that a large spill in the range of 8 million gallons was highly unlikely, and calculated that such a spill might occur once in 241 years. Since the opening of the pipeline in 1977, tankers have taken on more than 300 billion gallons of North Slope oil here at the Valdez terminus. More than 25% of the crude oil produced by the United States. Oil tankers had made 9,000 safe passages through Prince William Sound until the grounding of the Exxon Valdez. Immediately after the accident, the National Transportation Safety Board launched an investigation into what went wrong. Captain, what's the range? At a maritime training center at Kings Point, Long Island, 
A computerized simulator of a tanker bridge has been programmed to replay the events that led to the grounding. Half ahead. Half ahead. Training center personnel stand in for the Valdez crew. Valdez traffic, this is the K-Orf. Over. Course Valdez recordings that track the movements of the Exxon Valdez have been thoroughly analyzed to produce this simulation. The only other evidence available to the NTSB is the sometimes conflicting testimony of the crew. Let me kind of set the stage about what occurred on the bridge of the Exxon Valdez that night. The ship left the pier with a pilot aboard and was sailing out through the Narrows. At a point uh, at which the pilot was supposed to leave the ship, he called for the captain to return to the bridge, which is standard operating procedure. The captain returned to the bridge, the pilot left the ship, the third mate escorted him down to the uh, pilot vessel. And the captain ordered a, a course of about uh, 220. In order to avoid ice flows, the captain then ordered course changes that took the ship from the usual outbound traffic lane across the inbound lane. The time was 11.42 p.m., two and a half hours into the journey. The captain stayed on the bridge for a few minutes and then went to his cabin, turned the controls over to the third mate. The third mate testified that he had orders to turn back towards the traffic lanes when the ship was a beam of Busby Island Light, a well-known channel marker. But for reasons still under investigation, the ship continued straight past the light for about six minutes before beginning the turn. There's some unknown areas that, that remain. Questions concerning what the actual track of the vessel was. And that would tell us more about whether or not an order was made to turn the vessel soon enough. Right, 10. We know that an order was given for 10 degrees right rudder, 20 degrees right, right 20. rudder, and hard right rudder. Hard right. But it was too late. At about eight minutes past midnight, the Exxon Valdez crashed into Bly Reef. The National Transportation Safety Board is still investigating the questions that surround the accident. Was the ship's captain drunk? Did he give the proper orders? Was the third mate qualified to command the bridge? The results of the investigation are due out in the spring of 1990. Meanwhile, Captain Joseph Hazelwood faces charges ranging from negligence to drunkenness and almost 170 criminal and civil suits have been filed against Exxon as the courts and the government attempt to assess liability for the disaster. Exxon President Lee Raymond. We, we've never said from day one that, uh, that Exxon wasn't responsible in the broad sense of the word. I mean, we owned the ship, we owned the cargo, the crew worked for Exxon Shipping Company, which is a company that Exxon Corporation owns. And therefore, uh, from the first, very first day, we, we accepted that responsibility. Uh, I think it, it, it's kind of peculiar in the sense that uh, we did, obviously didn't tell the ship captain to go out and run the ship on the rocks uh, and, and put a lot of oil into Prince William Sound. That was never the intention. And we were as horrified that it happened as probably anybody else. Responsibility for the accident is just one of many troubling issues surrounding the Exxon Valdez. The magnitude of the disaster pushed the limits of our ability to respond. And now, one year later, forces a larger question. Can there ever be an effective defense against a big spill? The spill in Prince William Sound was the largest, but not the only oil spill of 1989. Good afternoon, National Response Center. What state, ma'am? Each year, more than 6,000 marine oil spills are called into the hotlines at the Coast Guard National Response Center in Washington, D.C. No injuries, fatalities, evacuations. Usually, the spills are small. But about six times a year, the staff receives reports of tanker spills of more than 100,000 gallons. 
Admiral Joel Sipes heads the Coast Guard Division charged with protecting the marine environment from oil spills. Let's see what's going on today. He's worked on spills for almost three decades. Still, he's never seen anything like the Exxon Valdez. Volume alone would make it unprecedented, but then if you take that volume to a remote area in such a huge, enormous body of water as Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska, where the oil uh, ultimately spread, uh, you, you have to understand that it is a magnitude far beyond anything we've experienced uh, here in the United States. During the big spill, the Coast Guard was the federal agency charged with aiding and supervising containment and cleanup efforts. Technology. Later, the Coast Guard and the EPA were called upon to evaluate the response. The conclusion was blunt. Planning for and response to the Exxon Valdez incident was unequal to the task, and the spill was beyond the capability of technology currently being used in the United States. It was the Alyeska Consortium that was supposed to respond to the spill. Its contingency plan said that containment equipment would be deployed within five hours. But when the Valdez ran aground, Alyeska's emergency barge was in dry dock for repairs. It was 12 hours before efforts to contain the slick began. And by this time, almost 11 million gallons of oil had gushed from the ship. When they finally arrived on the scene, crews deployed barrier booms to corral the oil and oil skimming ships to remove it from the surface of the sea. But they were overwhelmed. The belated response was further aggravated by a lack of equipment and personnel. After 12 years of relatively trouble-free tanker operations in Prince William Sound, the first line of defense against a spill, containment, had been compromised. The equipment that was supposed to be there wasn't there. And not only did the Coast Guard cut forces in, in Valdez over the years, but Alyeska cut forces, the state cut forces. And in, in terms of preparedness, I think we may all be guilty of, of, uh, of having some effect on the accident by, by our actions. Actions taken by well-meaning managers uh, faced with management decisions. By the end of the first week, the slick covered nearly 100 square miles. Waves of weathered crude now smeared the coastline. According to the state of Alaska, only a small fraction of the oil spilled was recovered from the sea by booms and skimmers. Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Paul Yost is not surprised. The ultimate boom is a shoreline. Ultimately, most of the oil that you spill is going to go up on the shore someplace. That's unfortunate, but that's been our experience. It's so easy to put oil in a tanker. Man knows how to do that very well. What man hasn't discovered how to do is once oil is spilled from a tanker into the water, how to get that oil back into a tank. It's very, very difficult. In many situations, there's really almost nothing that can be done to prevent the spilled oil from coming ashore. But in those situations, it would be highly impolitic for both industry and government to just stand by and do nothing. I think it's a basic tenet of our society to try to do whatever we can to prevent a disaster, regardless of the cost, in whatever situation. And in a massive oil spill, we'll throw as many people and as much equipment as we can to try to contain it, even if historical experience shows us that those efforts do very little to contain the spilled oil. But in the Alaskan spill, one possible means of controlling the oil was not exploited, chemical dispersants. Exxon has charged that Alaska's bureaucratic fumbling prevented the timely use of dispersants. I guess if I'd been there on the first day, I would have put the dispersant planes in the air and they would have either had to get an injunction or shoot me down. Alaskan authorities have countered that conditions were not right for the effective use of dispersants. First of all, the companies did not have either the equipment or the dispersant on hand to do the job. But in addition to that, 
The conditions during the first three days of the spill, the time when dispersants might be expected to be most effective, were simply not right. The seas were calm. The uh, opportunity to use the dispersant in a high energy sea state, as is usually necessary to mix the dispersants and get some agitation there, uh, was just not present. Dispersants are chemical detergents that reduce the surface tension of oil, allowing it to break up into small droplets and disperse more easily through the water. Just weeks before the Valdez spill, the National Academy of Sciences completed a dispersant study that asked two basic questions. Do they do any harm and do they do any good? James Butler headed the study. Well, I think that there's a, a, a lot of expectation that the dispersants are going to cause some harm because they're chemicals. But the oil is also chemicals, and many of the chemicals in oil, and benzene, toluene are examples of this, are much more toxic than any of the dispersants. In general, uh, if you take a dispersed oil mixture and compare it with an, uh, a mixture, an oil that has been dispersed mechanically without the chemicals, uh, it produces uh, just the same toxicity in both cases. But are dispersants effective? In experimental settings, they can work if used promptly, distributed widely, and if the seas are choppy. In actual spills, however, there's been little documented success. Only a few people, uh, mainly Europeans and Br British, uh, have actually had any experience applying dispersants to oil spills. And the uh, uh, expectation, I think, from people who have not had that uh, experience is that uh, uh, they will spray the dispersant on the oil and the oil will disappear and it will stay away forever. In fact, that's not the case. The oil spreads out, it comes back together, it sinks, uh, it comes up to the surface, it goes through a lot of complicated uh, patterns. At Valdez, when they first sprayed oil in a calm sea and they said it didn't work, a lot of that may have been that they were expecting that the dispersant would just make the oil go away. And it didn't. The question remains, would the wide use of dispersants have made a difference in Alaska? In order for Exxon to have contained the spill by any means, uh, they would have had to be extremely lucky and many times more prepared than they were. Uh, the idea that dispersants would have helped, I think, is basically correct, but it's a very small portion of the total response that would have been needed. Like so many of the controversies surrounding Exxon's role in the big spill, this one will be battled in court. Two months into the spill, the oil covered 800 miles of shoreline and reached 470 miles south into the Gulf of Alaska. Focus had shifted from containment to cleanup, the only remaining defense. The long effort ahead raised the issue of who should take the lead and bear the cost. Since the spiller was an American company, the Coast Guard knew where to turn. The Coast Guard in the coastal area is responsible to direct the cleanup. Under the law, the law provides that uh, incentive for the spiller to take action first. Uh, we turned Exxon and they were willing to undertake the cleanup, which put us in a, in a, in a direction role, in a, in, a, in a role of overseeing their cleanup. And if at any time we considered that cleanup to be inadequate, we could have taken it over. In the end, over 1,000 miles of coast was sullied by the oil. Exxon promised to clean all of it, marshalling an army of 11,000 workers at the height of the effort. Using high and low pressure hoses, workers were able to wash some of the oil down the beach back into the water, where it could be trapped by booms and picked up by skimmers. Sometimes more aggressive measures were used to remove the sticky crude that coated the shore. Many beaches were scoured with hot water this did a better job of cleaning the rocks, but in the process, it destroyed plants and animals that had survived the oil. 
leaving behind a barren shoreline. And then there were the rock polishers, setting out to scrub each and every oiled stone by hand. But as time passed, it became harder and harder to remove the oil by any means. Paul Bohm is a chemist who conducted research for Exxon in Alaska. This is a fairly typical North Slope cargo oil. Um, it's rather pourable. It's very a fluid consistency, and uh, this is how it comes out of the ground and is pumped into the tanker. Now, when oil is spilled, it initially starts out in this consistency and very rapidly mixes with water and becomes emulsified. And this is called mousse. It's about 50% water and a very sticky type material that, that doesn't flow. These physical characteristics are very much tied into cleanup efficiencies and its potential environmental effects. When the oil hits a, a shoreline, and here's a typical rock from a shoreline, the oil still has many of the fluid characteristics, and it's quite tacky, and it adheres to different substances. With time, and um, in days to weeks, depending on the, the physical factors of the environment, this oil weathers more rapidly, and what you're left with is a material that's very difficult to remove, and also very difficult um, to mobilize. What you're seeing here is actually flakes of oil. So this weathering sequence is very much tied into the, uh, the cleanup, um, situation and potential environmental effects of the oil. If it's difficult to clean up at a desk, it's even more difficult on a remote beach in a subarctic climate. Cleaning the environment, removing all of the oil is, is impossible in this type of environment. The way you clean up, remove all oil, is to physically remove the substrate. If it were on a sandy beach, you could just scrape the beach and remove it. It's physically impossible in this environment due to the remoteness, the logistics, and the nature of the rocks, the boulders, the beaches, to physically remove the oil. So what we have to do is apply our cleanup strategies to series of treatment techniques, accelerating the natural cleanup processes. In other words, remove the gross oil from the surface of the beach and leave the rest to degrade over time. Biodegradation is simply the process of naturally occurring bacteria slowly eating away at the oil. During cleanup, the Environmental Protection Agency experimented with a new method to speed up the process. Inside these bags are briquettes of chemical fertilizers rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. When the tide washes over them, the fertilizer is dispersed, promoting the growth of the bacteria that consume the oil speeding up its natural biodegradation. The EPA and Exxon tested bioremediation, as it's called, on about 70 of the 1,000 miles of oil shoreline. Its full impact cannot be evaluated until several seasons have passed, and the waves of winter have pounded the beaches, churning up the oil, further enhancing its decomposition. The most optimistic projections are that it will speed the rate of natural biodegradation by about 50%. Unfortunately, all of the cleanup techniques placed some additional strain on the fragile environment as personnel and heavy equipment descended on these remote beaches. Halfway through the summer cleanup, Exxon revised its goal for the shoreline work. Beaches were to be treated or environmentally stabilized, not cleaned. The primary objective of beach cleanup is not an aesthetic one, particularly in a place where very few people ever see it. The primary objective, and I think probably everybody agrees on this, should be to try and restore the ecosystems and take the toxicity out of the system. What they promised to do was to leave a clean shoreline. This is not a clean shoreline. They may have treated it, which means removing the gross contamination at least the first time. But the job hasn't been finished. The decision to, to leave now, uh, I think, represents the, the worst in, uh, in corporate irresponsibility. We did a lot more, cleaned a lot more beach, treated a lot more beach, if you will, than we had committed to do back in May. 
And by the time we got done, we, the Coast Guard, had signed off on 1,089 miles of beach that we had treated. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it was all pristine. If uh, the only issue were, let's clean up the oil, let's produce the least possible impact on the fisheries, the least possible impact on the wildlife, they would not have done the extensive cleanup because the act, the act of bringing in thousands of people who leave trash all over the place and destroy the, the wildlife and scare it away, the, this is an impact all by itself. So there were a number of people who were on the scene who said that they thought the impact of the cleanup was worse than the oil spill itself and it should have been left to be cleaned naturally. Other people said, no, we've got to make Exxon clean up the oil because they owe it to us. And it's a, it's a matter of, of paying for their sins. Hmm? On September 15th, Exxon pulled out, citing the dangers of moving workers around in the approaching autumn storms. And even though the company spent $1.9 billion to treat 1,000 miles of shoreline, they left amid charges that the cleanup was a failure. To the Coast Guard, which worked alongside Exxon supervising and finally approving the cleanup, this criticism seems overly harsh. We were not prepared. Uh, that's a matter of frustration to me. Uh, and then when you go in and you do an honest effort and you find that any steps you take, and this is not sour grapes, uh, is not satisfactory. We're, we're, we're not satisfied in our own right with the way the cleanup went. Uh, but the public is angry about the way the cleanup went. And, and I don't think that's justified because there was an awful lot of effort put in to try to do the best we could do under the circumstances. Eric Olson is counsel for the National Wildlife story? Federation. This guy says we're kicking Exxon while they're down. Can you believe this? They are one of several conservation groups bringing multi-million dollar lawsuits against Exxon. Can develop a response to him. I think we all have a right to be angry at Exxon. We have a right to be angry at the Alyeska Consortium, which is all of the large oil companies that have pitched in to create a consortium that runs the Alaska pipeline. And we have a right to be angry because, first of all, the consortium and the oil companies have repeatedly told us, don't worry, there won't be a catastrophic oil spill. And even if there were, which of course won't happen, even if there were a catastrophic oil spill, we'd be able to clean it up and take care of any ecological damage that might occur. And what we've found is that obviously has not happened. There was a disaster that they told us would not happen and they weren't prepared to deal with it once it did. I don't think it's surprising to most members of the public that there are periodically tanker accidents, just like there are car accidents or train accidents. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's, that, that's what goes on. That's human error, it's, it's not zero risk kind of thing. Whether or not the public had been misled, I don't believe Exxon misled them. I don't think anybody had a deliberate campaign, if you will, of trying to mislead anybody. If the oil industry were to have said prior to the Exxon Valdez that a massive spill the size of the Exxon Valdez could and probably will take place, the American public would have been very upset. Then if on top of that they had said that the technology really does not exist to contain and recover a large amount of that spilled oil, all hell would have broken loose within the American public. In response to government and public pressure, Exxon has agreed to return in the spring of 1990 to consider if more cleanup is needed. Meanwhile, it's unclear how much oil remains in the environment. Of the nearly 11 million gallons spilled, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent is thought to have evaporated. The state says that perhaps 13 percent was recovered. Exxon claims it was closer to 25 percent. This leaves at least three and a half million and perhaps more than seven million gallons unaccounted for. Where did it go? And what are the environmental costs of this unrecovered oil? Researchers began arriving on the scene within days of the spill, hoping to answer these questions. They came from Exxon, the Department of the Interior, the University of Alaska, and many federal and state agencies. The oil's immediate impacts were obvious and grisly. 
sea otters were among the hardest hit in those early weeks. Some were poisoned by toxins in the oil, like benzene, toluene, and xylene. Many others succumbed to hypothermia when the insulating property of their fur was destroyed. Tens of thousands of birds were also killed by direct contact with the oil. And contaminated carcasses scavenged by healthy animals spread the toxins through the food chain. There were concerns that the region's salmon and herring fisheries would also suffer. The fish, especially when very young, are vulnerable to chemicals in the water. The plankton that are food for commercial and other species are also vulnerable, and if their numbers are reduced, the entire food chain can be undermined. Water samples from various depths were taken to assess the presence of oil and the health of these tiny organisms. Ted Cooney of the University of Alaska. What we have is a sample of the animal plankton community here in the surface waters of Prince William Sound. We weren't really sure what we would find. We know the, the, the very surface community, the new Stan community, and maybe the upper meter may have been affected by the oil itself, but in the water column below, we would expect that life to continue. And these, these little copepods and other zooplankters are the primary consumers, feeding on the plant cells, establishing the food web, that the, that the salmon fry and other commercial species will be feeding on. So I'm delighted to see these guys kicking here. Research like this suggests that little of the oil sank below the surface of the sea. And most scientists are optimistic about the eventual recovery of the sound. The bulk of the oil ended up on the shoreline and experts predict that over the coming years, the harsh Alaskan weather will remove much of it naturally. But could oil that persists, most of it beneath the rocky beaches, pose a continuing threat to coastal life? Marine ecologist John Teal. The effects of an oil spill are, are dramatic and disastrous, one as big as, as the Exxon Valdez spill. And then in the course of oh, a few years, most of the effects, most of the obvious effects, the things that the tourists are looking at now, will for the most part be gone. The remaining effects will be subtle. They'll be difficult to detect. It doesn't mean they won't be important, but they won't be readily obvious. In 1969, this salt marsh in Massachusetts was awash with thousands of gallons of fuel oil spilled by a grounded barge a few miles off the coast. This was all dead. All of this area was killed. John Teal witnessed the devastation here firsthand. Now, 20 years later, he and colleague Bruce Tripp have returned. Okay. Although the marsh appears to have recovered, They've come to see if any remnants of the spill can be found. Oh, oh wow, that is oil. It doesn't look oily particularly. You can't see but it, anything. But it's really fuel oil. There's no question about it. You've smelled that often enough. And you can see it on the surface of the water down there. Analysis of the 20-year-old oil shows that it has lost many, though not all, of its toxic properties. But it's not known if the persistence of oil means that it's still having some biological impact. Historically, it's been difficult to sustain the kind of research needed to evaluate the lingering effects of an oil spill. For one thing, the funders, the people who are paying for it, don't like to pay for long-term results because, well, partly because the, the uh, excitement is gone after a little while. The, the news is about the sea otters being killed or the birds being oiled. And the, the extent to which the shellfish or the fish recruitment or something is damaged 10 years from now, now being the time of any particular spill, is not very exciting to most people. The great public interest in Prince William Sound seemed at first to create an opportunity for science to do the long-term study so often neglected in the past. 
Government, industry, and private funding poured into research efforts. But this opportunity may now be jeopardized as science becomes entangled in a complex web of multi-million dollar lawsuits that will determine how much, if anything, Exxon pays for damages. Everybody who's involved in the thing now has a lawyer at their elbow whenever they start to speak about it, and the lawyer keeps reaching over and tapping them and saying, don't say that. And one of the, the things on which good science depends is one scientist knowing what another is doing. If some study isn't being done right now, and nobody knows about it because none of the scientists can talk to each other, you can't go back and study it sometime in the future because the event has already gone past. There is good science being done on all sides of this issue, uh, Exxon, the federal government, the state government, etc. But the scientific exchange is not occurring. And over the long term, over the years, that's going to affect our ability to, to draw on this base of knowledge and apply it to other spills. The Department of Justice has advised all the federal agencies to not make information available. Uh, I personally don't support that. Uh, but I do think, uh, on the other hand, if the other agencies involved don't make their data available, it's difficult for us to defend putting our shareholders at a disadvantage. But we think that the gag orders that have been put out on government scientists really ultimately could be very harmful because it will not allow the American public and scientists worldwide to know what the full effects of the spill were. While the environmental price tag of the spill is negotiated in court, the oil industry and the government are looking for ways to reassure the American public that big spills can be avoided, or at least better handled in the future. Compiling accurate information for decision support. In the fall of 1989, an interagency meeting was held at the Coast Guard Training Center in Connecticut. Officials of the Navy, the EPA, and the Departments of Interior and Transportation were joined by Exxon and other industry representatives. One of the things that I hope we've learned from this is that we can no longer afford to, to go off in a corner and do this contingency planning by ourselves. We've got to Most agreed that a greater commitment to oil spill readiness is necessary. Government agencies are reviewing their capabilities and pushing for increased funding. For its part, an industry consortium has pledged $250 million to fund oil spill research and regional response centers. But this is not the first time that a big spill has motivated such commitments. In 1978, Nova went to Brittany to survey the scene of the Amoco Cadiz spill. 68 million gallons more than six times the size of the Exxon Valdez. The beaches were covered with black moose-like petroleum. Wildlife was devastated by the oil. And the community was outraged by the damage done to the environment and to their livelihoods. The oil industry was chastened by the catastrophe and spurred on to an examination of their defenses against major oil spills. And they made commitments to do better next time. A few months after the accident, an Exxon executive spoke about the oil industry's new resolve. Well, certainly the Amoco Cadiz to a to, uh, person such as myself, I think you've got to say, there but for the grace of God go I. And if we don't look at it that way, we'll be riding for a big fall in Exxon as well. So I think it, it causes a general re-examination of are our policies the correct ones? Are we treating our people correctly? Are we leaving no stone unturned? And I think basically that's what Amoco Cadiz has uh, done. and. I think if that produces results and prompt results, uh, maybe it will have been a good thing in the long run. After every major oil spill in the past, there's been a flurry of activity within industry, within government, to try to do something better. However, time passes, oil spills are low probability events, there may not be a massive one, and interest dies. Other environmental priorities take over, 
People are concerned about ozone depletion, the greenhouse effect, about hazardous waste contaminations. And the end result is that oil spills once again go into the corner and are fairly unnoticed. Unnoticed until another major disaster takes place. On the shores of northern New Jersey sits a relic from an era when oil spills were a national priority. For 13 years, this 600-foot concrete test tank was the scene of experiments into all kinds of oil spill technologies, booms, skimmers, and dispersants. Now it sits empty, a victim of cutbacks in the federal funding that supported oil spill research. Like most worthwhile ideas, OMSET came about as a response to a need, oil spill. Officially, the name of the facility is the Oil and Hazardous Materials Simulated Environmental Test Tank. <laughs> but try saying that over the phone a couple of times a day. Now, around here, we just call it OMSET. In its heyday, OMSET was the National Center for Oil Spill Research, a symbol of the promise of technology. The controlled environment of the tank enabled researchers to spill oil and evaluate techniques for cleaning it up. It was a place where state-of-the-art technologies could be pushed to their limits and new approaches could be developed. I know this may sound conceited, but if I were just hearing about OMSET for the first time, I'd really be glad to know it's around. Pretty good shape on the hole. I'm really amazed from what I've seen and how well it does. It has held up. Did a good job on shutting it. Today, two former researchers are here to inspect the facility and see what can be salvaged. It's not as pretty with no water in it, is it? No, not as useful either. Actually. Well, in the 70s and early 80s, Edward Tennyson of the Department of Interior and the EPA's Jack Farlow worked together at OMSET, trying to solve the technical problems of oil spill containment and cleanup. Now they're fighting to save the test tank and have it reopened. I think the closing of this, of this facility, uh, because of lack of funding, is really a national tragedy. To see this place down, and, and not being operated, and with the potential that it may never be operated again, is a source of real frustration for me because I know the value of this place. We've been working here since uh, 1974. There is no place else to go. Tennyson sees no shortage of research possibilities for a reopened OMSET. He'd like to test chemical non-dispersants like this new product, the last tall. When sprinkled or sprayed on an oil slick, it turns it into an elastic syrup that can be vacuumed or skimmed off the water in gummy strands. Early trials suggest that it may increase a skimmer's capacity by a factor of 10. He also sees promise in controlled burns, which can remove up to 90% of spilled oil if properly managed. And he'd like to continue the development of advanced skimmer technologies, such as the use of water jets to control an oil slick. Tennyson hopes that the Exxon Valdez disaster will motivate a return to oil spill research as a national priority. The government uh, responds to public pressure. At, uh, when this place was built in 74, started operating, oil spill was a major concern of the American public. Over the last uh, four years, that concern has dropped and has remained low until we've had the Exxon Valdez and then the three tanker spills uh, within a month. Uh, we're, start, we're starting to see increased uh, attention given by Congress. There are several bills that are being given serious consideration which would in fact bring oil spill response research money back up to a level necessary to operate this facility and to move on. Oh, the paint's coming off here. While efforts are underway to resuscitate oil spill research and response capability, another issue is revisited. The mangled Exxon Valdez sits in dry dock in San Diego, undergoing repairs, a stark reminder of how the big spill began. 
The wreck of this two-year-old $125 million supertanker has revived a long-running debate about whether we can prevent accidents by building a spill-proof tanker. When the Exxon Valdez ran aground, the rocks of Bly Reef tore through the steel skin of her hull, rupturing eight of her 11 oil tanks. What would it take to provide better protection for a tanker's cargo? The Exxon Valdez is designed to carry oil in 11 separate tanks, with additional tanks set aside for segregated ballast. Seawater pumped in to stabilize the ship when her cargo is unloaded. Segregated ballast tanks are strategically located to provide protection in the event of a collision with another vessel. As in most oil tankers, a single hull less than an inch thick is all that separates the cargo from the sea. However, in double-bottom tankers, often used in the transport of hazardous materials, the floor of the cargo tank is as much as 10 to 12 feet above the hull, creating a buffer zone between the cargo and the outer shell of the ship. Had she been designed with a double bottom, the Exxon Valdez could have cost as much as $12 million more to build. But would a double bottom have made any difference in Prince William Sound? I asked my naval architects to, to, give, to build for me a hypothetical ship, the Exxon Valdez with double bottoms. And in a, in, a, in a hypothetical way, again, run it through the same accident and tell me what they thought the oil outflow would be in that accident. Uh, there would have been, in, in our estimation, and it's very rough, uh, perhaps a 50% savings. And so we go from 11 million gallons to 5.5 million gallons. It's still the biggest incident that ever occurred in the United States from a tanker. Uh, there is some protection, but not near the protection that people might think. I do not consider that argument to be a valid one because the very fact that you have the double bottom, that when you strand, it's like with the Exxon Valdez, it's very possible because you have a double bottom, you won't even puncture the cargo tank. And if you have a double bottom and it's a very severe uh, stranding or grounding, then you may penetrate uh, one of the more of the cargo tanks, but it'll always be less damage to the cargo tank than the vessel without that double bottom. You know, there's a dilemma in double bottoms. Uh, the double bottom that you put under a ship uh, is to protect a ship from groundings. Um, admittedly, the large accidents that have occurred recently have been from groundings. But if you look a second, uh, if you look at our statistics overall, collisions occur almost three times more regularly than groundings. Uh, when you put double sides on, or you put segregated ballast tanks, for example, in the side of a ship, you're protecting against collisions. Collisions are more prevalent. So it depends on the route of the ship. Uh, in the case of vessels such as Exxon Valdez that ply between Valdez and Los Angeles, they're leaving Valdez where grounding is a problem and going to Los Angeles where collisions are a problem. So which do you protect for? That is the dilemma. One possible solution is a double hull around the ship's bottom and sides. This could have increased the Valdez cost by as much as $31 million and reduced cargo capacity by 25%. In 1978, when the U.S. proposed double bottoms as a worldwide standard, the idea was not considered cost-effective. The same is said of double hulls today. It will be expensive. The word prohibitive, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it, it all comes down to finally, uh, how much of this damage can we continue to take? Legislation pending in Congress would mandate that all new American tankers be built with double hulls, although single hull tankers would be allowed to ply American waters for the next 15 years. But even if tough new laws are enacted here, single hull tankers could not be eliminated worldwide without international agreement. And improved tanker design still does not address the real failure behind the Exxon Valdez disaster. 
What makes me the, the most angry is after all of our work to try to prevent spills, the darn thing still happened. Uh, it should not have happened in my view. Now, we, we have come a long way in this country in the operation of ships uh, and, and the qualification of people in, in all of those areas uh, where a spill like this was preventable, in my view. We're dealing one more time with the human element. It was an accident in its purest form. Working with the human element, training young cadets to be tomorrow's tanker captains and officers, is the mission of the Merchant Marine Academy here at Kings Point, Long Island. The cadets study ship operations and maintenance, and are schooled in the proper handling of dangerous cargoes. And certainly if something goes wrong, it's not easy to get out of a cargo tank. Any problems? Questions? Uh, it's going to be about 178. 178. Navigation and command decision making are their core curriculum. More than two thirds of all accidents are caused by human error, and these cadets learn that the errors of the future will be theirs to make or avoid. Make sure you get that. Just make that turn nice and sharp, all right, when you come around. Okay. Okay, get into the channel, dead center. And since the Alaskan spill, many of the big oil companies, including Exxon, have sent their personnel back to this academy for continuing education. Few would deny that the next generation of tanker captains is receiving the best possible training. Still, the Coast Guard is considering raising standards even higher, although it's uncertain if other nations will follow suit. We're working on the, the uh, certification of seamen, the documentation of seamen, and, this, and the certification of ship's officers. Uh, one more time, uh, we're calling for uh, access to the national driver's record, which will give us some idea of the, the, uh, the drinking habits of some individuals. Uh, we may not give them a license anymore. Seamen's documents, they used to be issued for a lifetime. We'd like to renew them every five years instead of have a lifetime document. Uh, there, there are many, many such things that we're doing, and, and they're, they're, we see them as opportunities to, to try to prevent uh, further occurrences. The Coast Guard is also testing systems to expand and improve radar and satellite tracking of oil tankers in coastal waters. One of the first test sites will be Prince William Sound. Still, optimism for the future is tempered by a new respect for the inherent risks of oil transport. If I were a betting man, and I hope I live a lot longer, I'm going to say in my lifetime there will be another big spill, in spite of everything we do. Massive spills are low probability events, but as the Exxon Valdez has shown, low probability events can and do take place. I most definitely don't think Alaskan Valdez is our last big spill. Hopefully it'll be the last big spill in Prince William Sound. It's been almost a year since the grounding of the Exxon Valdez. Soon it will be a new spring in Prince William Sound. The rough seas of the Alaskan winter have pounded the beaches, removing some of the most obvious signs of the spill. The birds will return, as will the otters and the sea lions. Over time, Nature may restore this wilderness. But in the wake of the Exxon Valdez, the beauty here is bittersweet. This is a watershed event for the nation as a whole. I think millions of Americans are simply outraged at what has happened here. It's never going to cease. People will remember the Exxon Valdez a decade, two decades from now. And we think that we have to harness that public outrage and turn it into energy towards making some changes in the way that we do business. 11 months after the accident, the response centers proposed by the Oil Industry Consortium are still on the drawing board. Congress is waiting for a new review of ship design and Coast Guard recommendations 
and is yet to mandate double bottom tankers. The OMSET test tank in New Jersey sits empty while efforts continue to have the facility reopened. On January 2nd, 1990, 500,000 gallons of oil spilled into New York Harbor from an Exxon pipeline. Operators failed to notice the leak for six hours. This was one of more than 6,000 oil spills reported in U.S. waters since the grounding of the Exxon Valdez. A question hangs over Prince William Sound. Will we be ready for the next big spill? Or as the visible traces of oil fade away, will the resolve to do better next time also fade away? Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to this address or call 212-227-READ.